So you're very welcome. On behalf of the Mid-Ulster uh, Labour Market Partnership, I am Pamela Ballantyne. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on a very, very relevant topic. It's menopause in the workplace. Now, this is the latest in a new series of Lunch and Learn webinars, where the Mid-Ulster LMP hopes to help employers across a range of areas, such as flexible working, recruitment, retention, leadership, disability, inclusion, and awareness, etc. Now, first of all, just a wee bit of housekeeping. Now, today's session is being recorded so we can upload to the Council's website for those who can't attend. But cameras and microphones are turned off for all attendees, so you will not be seen or heard at any time during the session or recording. We'd love for you to make the most out of today's session and ask any questions you would like to. Now, you can do this by using the Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar at any time during the presentations. Just pop your question in there with the name of the speaker you would like to ask this to, and we'll pick up all of those in our Q&A session. That's going to be right at the end after we've heard from our speakers. Now, if you wish to ask your questions anonymously, you can choose to do so whilst typing your question. So now that's out of the way, a brief introduction to the great work of Mid-Ulster's Labour, Labour Market Partnership. It's funded by the Department for Communities as part of its Employability Northern Ireland programme. The LMP was created in 2021 to positively impact the labour market locally, addressing local issues. Now, this involves helping residents who are out of the workforce for whatever reason to access sustainable work opportunities through relevant accredited training and one to one employability support, upskilling residents to gain additional skills and therefore better jobs and helping local businesses both to find these employees as well as receiving relevant training and support too. Now, I would direct you to the web pages and social media channels. The link should be on the screen somewhere. So visit the website midulstercouncil.org slash midulsterlmp or search for Mid Ulster LMP on Facebook or LinkedIn to be kept up to date with all the academies, the programmes and the events. So now back to the webinar. Today, we are concentrating on that very relevant topic, as I said, menopause in the workplace. Now, current research has highlighted that almost 30% of our current labour force is aged 50 and above, and a large percentage of these are female. Therefore, the topic of menopause and how it impacts women on a day-to-day -day basis is very important. It is still a taboo subject for many, and as I know, it's confusing, it's frustrating, and otherwise extremely, for otherwise extremely capable women who uh, you can get brain frog, it just takes over and you cannot think of the correct word. Or a hot flush starts in the middle of a meeting. I could feel one coming on one day when I was reading the news. And when I flush, I went the colour of my jumper and I looked like I had a bucket of water poured over me. It was horrendous. I have never got through a news bulletin quicker in my life. So today we're going to hear from three speakers. And yes, we have an all female panel today, which wouldn't normally happen, but we figured that the subject matter today would allow for this for at this time. First up, I'm delighted to introduce Tara Grimes. She's a local menopause advocate who does a lot of great work coaching and training women to understand how to help their bodies cope with the changes and the associated symptoms. Now, Tara is a well-known fitness instructor and life coach. And today she's going to talk to us about the more common symptoms women can suffer from and how they can impact their work life, how they can tackle those from a well-being point of view and simple things employers can do to make things easier for employees. So, Tara, it's over to you. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see me. I hope you can hear me. Hi, everyone. My name is Tara Grimes. And I am, as Palma said, I am an expert in menopause. Not only do I am I a fitness, I'm also a nutritionist. Um, I'm currently going through the menopause myself. And I coach women all over the world, deal with the symptoms and the knock-on effects of going into the menopause. It has a huge impact on our life as women um, in our 40s and our 50s. And a lot of people don't understand, particularly employers, the cascade and the change in hormones 
that happens when we hit this stage in our life and how it can impact every area of our life. And this isn't something that's dreamed up and it's not a notion in our heads as the old saying goes, this is a very real thing and it can have an impact on our mental health, it has an impact on our physical health, which can have another part of our life. So we'll just move to the first slide. So actually what happens in menopause and when clients come to me, they're already experiencing the feelings. And for a lot of women, it's the menopausal symptoms that create a change. And it's, it's amazing when these hormones kick in, it changes how we feel. So it changes how we look and in turn it changes our feelings about ourselves. It can impact our confidence, it can impact our self-esteem and we feel we have no control over it. So as a coach, in terms of nutritional interventions, fitness interventions and helping women deal with regulating their emotions so that they don't, you know, get themselves involved in what I would call risky behavior of overeating, over consuming, reaching for outside things in order to make themselves feel good, helping them understand exactly what happens. So there's three main hormones, one in particular that governs all these changes. And when I mean changes, I don't mean subtle changes. I don't mean like, for instance, men, their testosterone decreases gradually. Women's hormones literally fall off the end of a cliff. And as you can see here on this um, on this chart, you can see the age, just from the ages between 40 and 55, hormones, particularly estrogen and progesterone, they literally nosedive. They go to baseline, okay, which has a massive impact on our sleep and our energy and our cognition or mental cognition. And as Pamela had said there, as, as a mum, and a woman in her 50s this morning i had to go through i have four children i had to go through all my children's names to get to my youngest daughter olivia so in three tom is about you know anybody listening to this who's my age will understand this you just have to think a little bit more it has such a knock-on effect on our mental clarity and this is not something as i say we've dreamed up it's not something that it's a notion in our head the old wives tale sure it's just a notion to you it's not a notion this is very very real um, so as you can see, they, they nosedive. Next slide, please. So what age, what happens? And, and for a lot of employers and for a lot of women as well, they know they're going through the menopause, but they don't actually know how, why this is happening, what hormones are at play here. And the average start of perimenopause is 48 when periods stop due to the inactivity of the follicles. And as somebody says to me the other day, and I thought this was the funniest thing I thought, when the baby factory stops, <laughs> stops operating, it goes into liquidation, the whole thing shuts down. The average start of menopause is around 51. But hot flashes, which is the vasomotor symptoms associated with menopause, which promises can have a massive impact on our physicality, but also our mental health, because we're always worrying when they're going to happen. These can last for an average of five to seven years, but can last over a 12 year period as well, and many case decades. Now, also, if you're going through the menopause later in life, if you haven't, you know, if you're sitting there and you're 55 and you still haven't felt those symptoms, that's actually probably a good thing because later menopause is associated with better health as well. So what are these menopausal symptoms? So for employers, and as an employer myself, I employ women in their menopause. A woman going through it and I employ women who are currently going through it at two you know greater or lesser degrees they're symptomatic of these vasomotor symptoms you know the big and women come to me predominantly because their body composition changes they gain fat they get fat on parts of their body that they never had before and a lot of women if you're if your scale weight doesn't change from the age of 25 to 55, at 55 postmenopausal, your body composition will change dramatically, even if your scale weight doesn't change. And this can have an issue in women's self-confidence. They don't fit into their clothes. They don't feel good about themselves. So you're helping women not just deal with their dietary changes, their fitness changes, but also help them regulate their emotions so that they don't get involved in emotional eating or reaching out for alcohol or other responses to dealing with this massive change in their life. Night sweats, you know, if you're suffering from hot flushes and night sweats, 
that can have a massive impact on your cognition the next day, your health-seeking behaviours around food the next day, but also your metabolism with a thing called sleep disturbance, which can be linked to night sweats, that affects what's called sleep metabolism, which can have an effect, an effect on your metabolic rate as well. Heart palpitations, low mood and depression, which also I think is a symptom of women when they start to feel these changes, their body is physically changing. This can affect us in a very, very negative way. We feel like we're losing ourselves a little bit, but the reality is our body might be changing, but we there are interventions around diet and lifestyle that I'm going to walk through that will help you get that back. For me, it's about us taking the control back, knowing that these are the changes that are happening, but this does not have to define you. You don't have to become this, that we can take control back in our lives through different interventions in our lifestyle that I'll walk you through. You know, a lot of women as well, cognitive decline, as I said, this is probably one of the biggest challenges for me. And I'm finding that my sleep, my lifestyle, my diet, my behaviours around alcohol have had to change completely in order to keep my cognition high and my mental clarity high. Sexual dysfunction and a loss of libido, which can also impact personal relationships. And also we're at higher risk of cardiovascular disease as we move into our menopausal years as well, so more so than we were in our 20s and 30s. So a lot of women come to me because they want to lose weight. The changes in their body is having a massive impact, particularly around the lower tumor area. Women become less gynoid in shape, less female in shape, and become more like male. They become more male oriented in their fat distribution and their body shape as we go into menopause and these hormones nosedive. So this has an impact as well on our cardiovascular health. But a lot of women think that because I'm in menopause, and look, you can beat me up afterwards for this, menopause actually does not make you gain fat. So being in menopause doesn't increase fat stores on your body. What it does do is it redistributes fat stores on your body to a more male oriented shape, lower tummy, tops of arms, tops of back. And look, whether you like it or not, this does have an adverse effect on how we feel about ourselves, as say our self-esteem. And for me as a coach, I'm helping women to deal with their diet, look at their fitness, look at their body composition and try and take them back to baseline as well. So the reason women do increase the fat stores on their body, as you can see, this little chart here shows you that women generally get fatter and increase their fat stores as they age and it's not because of age as i say you can beat me up later after this one i don't be very popular for saying this to, to people but this is the facts these are the facts it's because we move less our neat activity decreases we don't move about as much every day that everyday activity moving around the house and out of the office when our kids are younger i know my neat activity was super high because it was never off my feet now i'm sitting at a desk we're more sedentary the pandemic's created the perfect Storm for fat, a storm for fat accumulation because we're now sitting at desk within touch and uh, distance of the snack cupboard. We can have snacks all day and nobody judges us and we can eat them and we aren't moving as much. Plus this sleep disturbance I was talking about in menopause, this sleep disturbance reduces your metabolic rate. It reduces your ability to maintain muscle mass, which in effect which, which in turn affects your metabolism. And this we're talking about here, slower sleep metabolism. My sleep and a lot of my clients' sleep is massively impacted. And this in turn affects their health-seeking behaviors around food the, less, the next day. We are less likely to go for that walk or go for that gym session or stand and cook ourselves a healthier meal. We want something quick, we want something handy, convenient and super tasty, which also tends to be ultra processed and high in calories as well. So this is the big one for me as a coach. Cancer is the boogeyman for all of us. You know, we think of the big C and we think about this, the risks and helping ourselves and protecting our health around, you know, more sort of negative health outcomes. But the reality is, as menopausal women, we are at higher risk of heart disease. Heart disease kills five times more women than breast cancer. Your risk factors increase if you're overweight and obese. And this is where my job as a coach comes in to take women's risk factors down. Sedentary or low activity levels, a low muscle mass. So if you haven't been stimulating your muscle on a regular basis from the age of 30 to prevent sarcopenia and osteopenia, you're also at higher risk of poor cardiovascular health outcomes. A large waist circumference. A waist circumference over 32 is indicative of poor health outcomes blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, and then age. As we age, again, we're at higher risk. 
So HRT, Davina has been out there champing on HRT. It was one of those things we never really talked about. And I'm sure everybody now all you hear is HRT, menopause. Whilst I'm a big advocate of self-help, taking responsibility, making sure that we cover, cover all areas in terms of our lifestyle, our diet, our fitness, our sleep, our stress management. HRT has had a massive impact so much for women um, during menopause. Now, I personally don't take HRT, but I know a lot of my clients take it and are, are feeling tremendous benefits from it. I'm not a doctor. I can't really go into it too much. So talking to your local GP or some pharmacists now have special menopausal clinics and special HRT. They're specialists within the pharmaceutical team, so it's definitely worth chatting to them. But we do know these facts, that heart disease can reduce risk of coronary artery disease by 40 to 50%. So if you're starting HRTs within the first 10 years of menopause, it can significantly reduce your risk as well of heart disease. And if you start after that period, maybe in your 60s, then it may slightly increase the risk. That said, ladies, let me just make this clear as well, that there are women who are taking HRT who think it's the magic bullet. Just remember, this is in correlation and to supplement a healthy lifestyle. So try and tick all the boxes. Don't depend on the hormones to help you. Look at your weight management, look at your diet, look at your lifestyle, look at your stress management. These are really, really important. Exercise, I'm not going to go into too much, but I'm sure you all know by now, unless you've been living under a rock, that the exercise that's really, really recommended for women in menopause are as follows. We know that our muscle mass decreases. This is the most important commodity we have as women, is our muscle mass. You know, if you lose muscle, you will lose muscle at, from the age of 30 onwards at a greater rate if you are not eating enough protein in your diet and if you're not stimulating it through regular exercise. So your muscle mass will be lower if you don't exercise much, if you're eating very little protein, if you've got inflammation in your body, more, the less muscle you have, the greater chance that you have more inflammation in your body. Insulin resistance, you're at higher risk with less muscle mass, you're at greater risk of injury, and also the hormonal changes as well. So for me as a coach, a nutritionist, and a personal trainer, this is one of the key things we do is we get our, our clients involved and in gentle. First of all, start off, don't go at it like a bull in a china shop, <laughs> baby steps, you know, starting off with gentle resistance exercises, good functional movement, making sure that we're in our 60s and 70s, we're future proof in our body so that we don't need support and help, that we are independent and that we're still maintaining good health, good mobility, good functional movement, and the ability to do simple things like get up and down the stairs, get in and out of the car, carry shopping bags. That's really, really important, ladies. And having good muscle strength, it's transferable through your entire life. So the impact of training on, meso on menopausal clients Getting that, we talk here these 10,000 steps. You know, if you're sitting at the minute and you're 2,000 steps a day, don't jump to 10, incrementally increase it, okay? It's also advised to lift weights or do some sort of resist or physical activity 30 minutes a day. Now, we know that resistance training in particular can help with hot flushes. And we know that women who resistance train have less frequency and severity of hot flushes as well. Now, it's not too late to take it up. I am coaching women at the minute in their 60s, and we have them in lovely, gentle home workouts with simple resistance exercises. Not just are they feeling better, but they're feeling stronger. They're able to do things that they've never done before. And this is at 60 years of age. So this is, look, this is up for everybody. We can all avail of this if you're open and ready to start taking responsibility to improve your own health. This is the big one and a lot of women come to me and they exercise they do all the resistance training and they're running marathons and they're walking but still they can't control the fat on their body diet is huge ladies you know your body right now as it sits 90 to 95 percent of it as somebody said to me the other day it's amazing the damage that this little hole in your face can do you <laughs> and i can't agree i'm sure everybody listening to this can resonate with this your diet is so so important but it's not, there's so much scaremongering out there around diet. There's so much misinformation. I'm going to keep it really simple and evidence-based for you. We're going to come back to the most important thing in your life right now as a menopausal woman is your sleep. This is more important than your diet. It's more important than your exercise. It's more important than anything. If you don't get a good night's sleep, ladies, it 
you're setting yourself up for a world of pain. So we're looking at seven to nine hours sleep a night. We have a coach in our program called Tom Coleman. He works with all our menopausal clients. He has completely transformed my life because he's helped me look at my sleep quality, not so much the quantity of 79 hours, but the quality. It also helps with your ag- appetite regulation. A lot of menopausal women struggle with sugar cravings and the sugar cravings is a symptom of poor sleep. It's a drop in estrogen, it's a drop in blood sugar levels because they're they're basically lacking in sleep. They're exhausted. And again, this also, if you're not sleeping properly, you're not protecting that, that very precious commodity called your muscle mass, you're less likely to lose fat. Your sugar cravings will be through the roof the next day. And again, you're getting that reduced sleep metabolism, which is making it even harder to maintain weight as well. So if you are listening right now, and whether you're a man or a woman, and you're thinking, yeah, I need to shift some timber here, this is the most important thing, okay? Creating the calorie deficit in your body, the law of thermodynamics, what goes in here and how we move our body. As the research showed and the evidence proved, women get fatter as we get older because we put more into this little hole here and we move less. And that's the bottom line. So we can control this by eating less. We don't have to change the world. We don't have to take food groups out. It's really important that we have all food groups and they support our optimal nutrition in our diet and our lifestyle. But creating that calorie deficit is key. And it can, for most people, it's just simple little things, maybe like too many snacks, under mealing and over snacking. So more dietary protein. And again, there's three essential, um, there's three macronutrients within all the food we eat. We have proteins that you're probably hearing more and more about. There's carbohydrates and healthy fats. We need all three in our diets. And unfortunately, some of the fatty diets that are out there now tend to take food groups out or they eliminate chocolate, or they eliminate the foods that we love and we enjoy. Your diet should be consistent of all things. It's really important that we really, as as aging women, we eat more dietary protein. I talk there about supporting your muscle. Your muscle is protein, so we've got to eat it more in here to support this, to help us with our future proofing of our bodies. It's an essential amino acid. It's the building blocks of our body, of our skin, our hair, our nails. And again, what I would advise my clients to do is to make it the priority on their plate, aiming for 30 to 40 grams a meal. If you're a non-meat eater, if you are vegan or you're vegetarian, again, we can get non-meat-based products. We can get plant-based options for getting that protein as well. And also including more dairy in your, your diet as well. That's really, really important for calcium. So what is a healthy diet? You know, women come to me and they go, Tara, I just want to lose weight. What do I do? And my my whole ethos and attitude around this is that this has to optimize your life. You cannot park your life for this. You have to have that little glass of wine if you love a glass of wine in moderation, a little bit of chocolate in moderation. To me, life is for enjoying. It's not for parking for you to get to a certain weight. If you fall under the high risk category, And weight loss is not the be all and end all for a lot of women. A lot of women in menopausal years, it's not about the diet. It's usually about regulating our emotions. It's about feeling bad about ourselves or getting to the stage in our life where we think, is this what it's come to? You know, I I can't, I can't maintain my weight anymore. I have no energy to exercise. I'm juggling all these balls. I'm rearing a family. I'm dealing with elderly parents. I'm holding down a full-time job. I'm not sleeping. My diet's not great. There's so many variables in this, ladies. So it's really important to keep it really, really simple. Be very sympathetic to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Please do not be removing the things out of your life that give you joy, like chocolate, the odd bit of ice cream, the odd glass of wine, because you don't need to. You know, it's about energy balance. It's about getting more, think about energy optimization. For me, I look at my clients and I say, this is not about losing weight. This is helping. I want you to regulate your emotions to help you think about your body in a healthier way, to support your body. We have all got to this stage. If you're watching this now, your body has got you to where you are right now at this point in time. You're doing okay. You're doing okay. But here, it has to take us another 30 or 40 years. So we need to start looking after it. The way we'd look after our own home or we would service our car and wouldn't bat an eyelid about that, we have to look after ourselves. It's our responsibility. And it's important to make sure that our diet is nutritious, that 80%, the simplest way I look at this is 
And this is a lovely way of thinking about your diet because you're not berating yourself or guilting yourself. If you want to have a glass of, uh, glass of wine or a bar of chocolate or some ice cream or have a lovely meal out with your family, if 80% of your calories in a week are from whole foods, proteins, high fibre vegetables, your favourite carbohydrates, and then 20% from your odd little bit, your treats, you know, for me that would be a bar of chocolate every day, you know, a dessert at the weekend, maybe having some ice cream with my family, you know, that gives me joy, that gives me balance. I don't feel guilty about that. That's part of a balanced lifestyle, you know, but the rest of my life is consistent and my meals are great. So then you don't guilt yourself about eating this. And I think this is why women tend to be all or nothing on the bandwagon, off the bandwagon with this whole health kick thing, because they're trying to be perfect. You know, if I can't be perfect, I'm going to procrastinate. It's the perfection the versus the procrastinator. If it's not perfect, it's not good enough. So I fall into that all or nothing mentality, which is the death knoll to any progress you're ever going to make with your health. You don't need to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. We just have to be better than we were last week, last month, last year. That's all we're asking for. We have plenty of time, ladies. We have loads of time. So, you know, look at optimizing your plate. Plenty of protein, plenty of color. That will make you feel better. That will give you more energy. It might also help you sleep better because you're not wired up in sugar or caffeine before bed. It might improve your sleep. That walk in the morning, we know an early morning walk has a massive impact on our circadian rhythms and our setup of our sleep for that night. So simple things, sleep, diet, getting that movement in the fresh air first thing in the morning is so important. There's small, excuse me, there's small little things that we can give ourselves, that we can give ourselves that are free, that we can start implementing slowly. Don't try and do it all at once. Look at the most important thing, maybe the low hanging fruit that you need to change. What is it in your life that you're struggling with right now? If it's your diet, start adding more vegetables, start adding more protein. You know, if it's your movement, Go for a 15 minute walk. I can guarantee you when you're out for 15 minutes, you'll feel great and you think, oh, sure, I'll go an extra five minutes. And then you just build on that. Don't set yourself unrealistic targets that you know in a probably already stressful life. It's another issue that you have and maybe another you didn't take off that day that will create more overwhelm, more stress. We need to reduce stress, ladies. That's really, really important. For employers who are listening to this, this is really important. And I have a husband, I have a son, I have a father, and thank goodness that the messages that are out there now in the social media, Mid Ulster Council are really promoting this in a very, very positive way. There are measures that are required that are mandatory for women going through menopause. As I said, this isn't a notion, this is a very real thing. So simple things like I know even for me, taking that walk in the day or even going into a quiet room and just sitting down, having a rest area or a quiet room where you can gather your thoughts. When you have a million different things and there's a lot of noise going on here, that creates more fatigue. It lowers our, our ability to make clear and good and focused decisions. So taking that time out is really, really important. You know, Pamela talked about the vasomotor symptoms like hot flushes, hot flashes, you know, those can be debilitating. Women stop going out of the home because of these, because they're so embarrassed. So introducing cool systems and fans for women to, who experience them and allowing them time and not asking questions if a woman has to leave a room very, very quickly. That's really, really important. And more relaxed uniform policies as well, so that women don't feel constricted or overheated in, in, in uniforms that maybe were okay in their 20s and 30s, but for a menopause, women may cause issues, especially in the, the months now we're coming into the spring, summer, it's going to get warmer. And obviously, if a woman has an issue with overheating, and I know I'm a lot warmer now, and I don't know about you ladies, but my sleep attire is a lot less now than it was when I was in my 20s and 30s. You know, it could be minus three degrees outside, but, you know, it's, it's summer bedwear for me, you know, and this is a reality. So that cooler clothing is really, really important. Promoting flexibility of location as well. You know, even simple things like today, for me, it's getting out of somewhere that's really, really hot, getting into somewhere that has good air circulation. And, you know, it's funny me talking about this because this is something I never would have understood as a younger woman. Probably men don't understand this either, but if you're hot and you're flustered and you're already feeling anxious and you're already tired, these simple things are really, really important to us, really, really important. And having the days too where you're so exhausted 
and you're so overwhelmed. Somebody asked me the other day about menopause, and I said, it's like having a young baby again. It's like having a young baby at home. Like I have, I had two children, I had Irish twins. I had two children within 11 months and the two of them didn't sleep. And this is like, I had said to my husband, this is like the time Tom and Alice were babies. This exhaustion, this getting up every day and you know, maybe having to reach for a coffee to give you a jizz in the morning. This feels like that time again. I never thought I'd have to go back to that time, but I'm back in it because I'm going through these symptoms. So as an empl- a self-employed woman, I can give myself that opportunity to be more flexible with my shifts. If I have a really, really hectic day and I'm not feeling up to it, I can push my appointments back. I have that luxury. So I think it's lovely for employers as well. And one of my ladies at the minute is really experiencing menopausal symptoms and we've given her some time off you know, to help her deal with a lot of issues, plus these symptoms. And I know when she comes back in, she'll be brighter, she'll be sharper, she'll be well rested, and she'll know and will know what to do moving forward. But that kindness, that support, that empathy, and that community, it's really, really important. So thank you very much for Mid Ulster Council for allowing me to come in today and to talk through this. This is really important stuff. As I say, my job is to help. If you want to work with me, you can contact me. I'm on social media, Tara Grounds Fitness, Facebook Tower Grounds Fitness drop me a message. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or help you in any way. This is my job. This is what I do. I am you. I am going through it. I know what it's like. But thank you so much today for hearing me out. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Thank you. Tara, thank you so much indeed. That was uh, absolutely brilliant. And I hope a lot of um, employers, etc., will take a, a lot out of that as well. Um, it's uh, it's definitely a, a subject and so many things that you were covering there that I totally recognize. I actually have this little thing that it's my little neck fan, which is wonderful. People think I'm wearing headphones, but it's a wonderful little neck fan um, and it goes right up to button five. It's tremendous. And I also have a little fan beside the bed. So everything helps. And um, those things are not expensive either, like something like a tenner on Amazon and um, other dealers um, and shops are available as well but Tara thank you so much indeed any questions for Tara please type them into the Q&A box and I'll pick up all of those at the end well next up I'm delighted to uh, welcome Jennifer Cruikshank now Jennifer is the HRCR manager within Henry Brothers Henry Brothers is a local construction firm based in Maharafeld and despite being part of an industry that is as we know predominantly male Henry Brothers has carried out lots of work to increase awareness and train their employees, male and female, to understand how menopause can impact. Now, Jennifer, you're very welcome. And I believe you're going to highlight a number of initiatives your company has put in place that can easily be re- re- replicated, I should say, by other employers and talk about the benefits for your company. So over to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Pamela. Next slide, please. Yes, I have been asked to speak about our journey for menopause in the workplace. Next slide. Accomplish or to quote Eisenhower, accomplishments will prove to be a journey and not a destination. And we are still on that journey with uh, health and well-being generally in the workplace, um, including menopause. Next slide, please. Where that all started uh, for our journey was through our membership of Business in the Community, which is a responsible business network uh, here in Northern Ireland. And next slide, please. That journey commenced through uh, our involvement uh, initially as a pilot, um, and then we went on to complete the Corporate Responsibility Standard core which is assessing our business and the initiatives that we deliver, how we monitor and record, and the the benefits we create across 10 key areas, including core values, people, planet, and place. And people including health and wellbeing and equality, diversity, and inclusion, and people development. Next slide, please. We currently are uh, platinum level which is the highest level achievable on the standard. But that journey uh, has taken some time. Next slide, please. We're one of just four companies in Northern Ireland to hold that level, 
uh, along with TransLink, Danske Bank and Belfast Harbour. But we have progressed through the years on our journey of learning and, and uh, development from the bottom level right up through to silver, gold and now platinum. Next slide, please. That journey has taken uh, a total of 10 years and we are continuing to create new improvements within the business. Um, my colleague Shannon um, heads up our as health and wellbeing champion and our equality, diversity and inclusion champion and has spearheaded a lot of the initiatives that we deliver. And that's Shannon in a nice red dress beside me in the, the pink and orange. Next slide, please. So what have we done that other businesses uh, might consider? And from what Tara has said earlier, showing that empathy and keeping lines of communication open are key. Um, and that starts with an HR open door policy where any of our members of our workforce, for whatever reason, have the confidence and trust to come to your sales if they have an issue. We also introduced a, a menopause at work policy. And within that, we also included managers guidance uh, for colleague discussions so that they would have a better understanding of how to deal with situations. We increased awareness then for our female workforce primarily um, by bringing in the mummy physios for an awareness session that are on the photograph at the top there. And um, then completed a lot of company newsletter and internal comms to promote um, different uh, help that is out there. Uh, so signposting our workforce uh, to what is available to them, including uh, Dr. Louise Newson, uh, the app that she uh, developed and promotes, um, which is free. Um, and that's an, uh, an extract from our company newsletter. We also have in place occupational health. So if someone is struggling to get answers and have a, a range of symptoms um, and not getting answers through their GP, we can refer them to occupational health as well for additional support. Um, and with it being quite a difficult time for uh, many women, um, we do have a personnel assistance program that's a free confidential external counselling service that is provided to our entire workforce. And internally, we have a number of mental health first aiders as well, if they want to speak to someone just internally. Coupled with that, then we have a range of flexible working options and where the job permits um, the option to work from home part of the week. Um, we've provided earlier uh, the option of doing earlier starting times um, and earlier uh, finishing times. We have um, reduced our, our Friday working to uh, uh, earlier finish as well. Um, so it's working with each and every individual to, to support them as best we can. We've also ruled out conscious inclusion training under our equality, diversity and inclusion, and that's to provide our workforce, male and female, an understanding and accepting and valuing the differences there are between people in the workplace. And that includes women and dealing those dealing with menopause. Next slide, please. Recognising that whilst we have a grown female workforce, and I'm glad to say we do, um, we recognise that there's quite a number of men who have partners or wives that are maybe going through this as well, or that they manage teams within the company that are uh, a number of women are working in, and it would be of benefit to them to understand um, what menopause was and how they as line managers um, should be supporting the business and our, our workforce. So in that, we partnered with business the community who run a, a range of link and learn sessions. And we've done one on menopause training for line managers. 
so that they could understand what menopause is, uh, when it happens, how it can affect people, to understand their role um, as the individual's manager, although HR support is always there as a backup as well, or just a sounding board or for guidance. Um, and how to have conversations with their staff about menopause and to know what menopause can affect, uh, that it affects everybody in, in a different way and the support that may be needed and the, the alterations to the, the work environment or their their job uh, may vary from person to person as well as sign posting employees to support. Next slide, please. It all forms part of a much bigger picture, um, not just for our corporate responsibility standard and our uh, corporate responsibility strategy as a company as a whole. Next slide, please. It feeds into the United uh, Nations Sustainable Development Goals, where all nations within the United Nations have agreed uh, to look after uh, good health and well-being um, uh, under uh, SDG 3, as well as gender equality in the workplace, which is SDG 5. Um, and therefore, we're, we're creating a much bigger picture. Next slide, please. So in all, we're trying to do our best to make a difference, and that continues to grow, for example, um, Quite recently, um, we have we're now re, uh, introducing um, PPE that's specifically fitted for women, rather than the standard unisex, uh, large, medium, small uh, sizes that we're actually going to have uh, PPE that, that's a, uh, suited to a woman's figure as well, which may make it a bit more comfortable too. So there's a, a range of things that we continue to do um, to make that difference. Next slide, please. And that's everything from me. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Jennifer. Um, I, I, that, that is unbelievable. Um, I think it is a fantastic template for uh, other employers that they could really, really learn from. So uh, thank you very much indeed. And once again, if anybody's got any questions for Jennifer, um, I'm sure she'd be more than happy to share, share the template that uh, Henry Brothers has with you. Um, as they always say, was it uh, the saying is a happy workforce is a productive workforce. And uh, it does sound like everybody could be very happy down at Henry's. But last but by no means least now, and don't forget if if you are going to ask questions, we've got a couple put in there under the Q&A banner, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom. Just put them in there and we'll put them to our speakers. Uh, and you can remain anonymous. Don't worry, you don't need to put your name on that. Um, and if you've got anybody specifically you would like to answer the question, let us know. Um, but as I say, last but by no means least, we have Anne McAleer from the Mid Ulster District Council. Now, Anne is the Policy Engagement and Equality Officer and was involved in developing and implementing the menopause support policy within Council and is going to give some advice to those who would like to develop something similar, who, uh, um, who to contact, who is there to help already. Of course, the barriers you may face and the benefits of having a policy. And delighted to have you here this afternoon. Thank you so much indeed for putting this into place in the first place. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you, Pamela. Um, I can take all the credit for implementing it, but I'll certainly um, take you through in terms of uh, what Mid Ulster Council has implemented and why. Um, so thank you very much um, to the LMP for inviting me to speak on behalf of the Council today. Um, I hope that there's learning to be had and learning to be shared. I know that I've certainly taken a lot from the previous two speakers already. Um, so if I could have the first slide, please. So the background as to why the, the policy was introduced, so I suppose my main role in council is developing policies, um, but as a fellow with a HR policy, my main role was advice and guidance in terms of its development. Um, the kudos goes to Sinead and Tanya within um, the council, uh, within the HR department for actually pulling the bones of it together. 
Um, but I suppose there had been a lot of lobbying for this council policy to be implemented. It was new, muted for a number of years prior to its implementation um, um, by, and adoption by council in December 2021. To be honest, there's lots of uh, policy proposals that's flowed about um, and there's procrastination over whether or not they should be implemented. And I'm delighted that this one was brought to fruition and brought over the line. And I suppose the reasons behind that, um, there's there's a number of them, but I've just detailed some of the main ones. So like uh, lots of other organisations, we have a really high percentage um, of our council staff that are female. We also have an ageing staff as well. Um, we had lots of excellent lobbying from our union representatives as well that were very keen for us to put this in place. I suppose they work at the coal face and they could see the need um, for, for a long time before the policy was developed. And I suppose like all um, organisations, there's a competitive labour market. So it just makes sense to put in place policies that support um, our members of staff. And whenever you're getting that feedback from the unions that this is the type of support that's required, it's time to sit up and listen. Um, and I'm delighted that that collaborative approach led to the development um, of this policy. If I could have the next slide, please. So in terms of uh, what was brought together for the policy aims and objectives, so there's lots of external guidance in terms of the types of aims and objectives that should be included in a menopause support policy. And um, the HR department um, took the decision to include the following aims and objectives. And while they just seem like three quite simple, straightforward um, things to put um, the policy to aim towards, they're really quite substantial whenever you break them down in terms of the environment in which we work. So the for first one is to foster an environment in which colleagues can openly engage in conversations about menopause. As I say, it just seems like a sentence, um, but whenever you are trying to foster an environment where menopause is not a taboo topic, it's something that we can speak about freely and openly. Um, so that, that was an excellent aim for inclusion in the policy. And then to ensure that everyone understands what menopause is and that they're clear about council's policies and practices. Again, Within the context of council, we provide really wide and varied roles um, from quite male dominated areas of the council. For So for us to aim that everyone understands this is not just a female issue, this is an issue for all of our staff. Um, it's to be supportive to your colleagues um, or it's to have that understanding and educate yourself. And then again, um, to educate managers about the potential symptoms of menopause and how they can support women at work. So our previous speakers have spoken about um, the wide and varied types of symptoms that can come across um, in terms of menopause and that it's not just a fleeting window. Um, it can go on for a long period of time. Um, and it's to educate managers, both male and female, about that um, and just have lots of more information widely available. And again, to start that conversation, as we said at the first bullet point, about menopause and, and to take away that taboo. Next slide, please. So for the so far policy then, um, again, the, you know, that's standard that it would apply to all staff and managers. And then it's the second bullet point as well um, is our HR department ensuring that everybody is included. So trans men and non-binary people may also experience menopause symptoms. And it's important to be cognizant of that as well, um, that even though people may identify as a different gender, their, the physicality of their body will still um, make sure that they um, have to go through the menopause um, symptoms as well. Um, and, and that's just something that needs to be pointed out as well, just because of a lack of awareness sometimes. Um, and then additional uh, scope is that the council will support all colleagues experiencing perimenopause and menopause transition and should be encouraged to ask for help. So again, it's starting that conversation. It's ensuring that the needs of our staff um, are met. Um, and, and that's really where I became involved in the policy. Um, so to, it was to put the meat on the bones then in terms of consultation, which we'll just detail in the next slide. So we knew um, we knew the aims and objectives and the scope of what we were doing. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please, then we'll look at um, consultation processes. So again, we're council officers, we work within that environment. Um, and in terms of implementing policies, it's good practice within the council to go for external um, guidance and consultation as well. And in this, in this instance, for this policy, um, we consulted with the Labour Relations Agency, we consulted with the unions, and we consulted with ECNA and the staff themselves to see what was implementable, what people wanted to see, um, and in terms of, you know, what, what needed to be detailed in the policy, what did people want. 
Um, so th those organizations were really, really useful. Um, and in terms of getting lived experience from people as well, it was really important in terms of the policy development. So next slide, please. So the main area of the consultation that I was involved in um, was with the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. So uh, I suppose in speaking with people, the parallels were being drawn between menopause and uh, pregnancy around uh, how that impacted on um, if people were off sick um, and that sort of thing. And I suppose when I did approach the Equality Commission, I was looking for you know, a one size fits all. Uh, how are we going to frame this in terms of a, its equity rather than equality? I suppose equity is what we aim to deliver for not only our staff, but our ratepayers as well. Um, it's giving people what they need rather than giving everybody the same thing. And, and that's what I, how I would have framed this policy. In terms of the Equality Commission from Northern Ireland, um, after careful consideration, they came back and said, you know, we would actually look at this in terms of not pregnancy, but disability. And as a woman, I was taken aback. I'm not going to lie. I hadn't, as somebody who works in the disability sector, I it hadn't dawned on me. But whenever they really pointed it out, it, it, it did make better sense. Um, so in order to be diagnosed with a disability, um, your GP or healthcare provider will look at the, the following three um, points. And that's that it's the condition that you have is long term, usually over a year. Um, that it's physical or mental. And that it impacts on your ability to carry out your day to day tasks and functions. And when they boiled that down, they said, look, when you're talking about menopause symptoms, sometimes it can be over a long term. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it can impact your physical and your mental health and carrying out your day to day tasks and functions. So we, as the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland, would look at it through that frame, which I have to say was a light bulb moment. Um, and it really changed um, our perception of the policy. And again, we don't have any other policies on any other specific conditions. Um, and it was it was something new in terms of policy development within the council. But whenever um, whenever the Equality Commission framed it in that area, we were able to think, OK, well, you know, accommodating disabilities within work placement is a legal duty. We know about this. We can do this. Reasonable adjustments within our council are wide and varied. Um, and that provided that familiar template, not that we were going to treat everybody with severe menopause symptoms as if they had a disability, unless they wanted to be classed um, in that frame, but that we knew the, the ways that we could um, accommodate different types of working and that we could put in those reasonable adjustments. And for us, reasonable adjustments are within the legislation, what they say on the tin there. They're a reasonable way to adjust your work placement, uh, whether that's your hours, where you're doing your work, how you're doing the work, the type of work that you're doing. They're reasonable and they're agreeable in the first instance to the person who requests them as well as to the employer. So that consultation was really, really useful. And again, as I say, it allowed us to, to frame the conversation um, as providing equity within our council policies, not just equality, which is, um, you know, providing the same for everybody. Next slide, please. So obstacles, um, you know, there was concern in the consultation. Would it be used appropriately? Would it be used at all? Would people um, really want to have... Um, you know, the conversation about menopause, but they want to go and speak to a male boss um, about symptoms that they were experiencing. Um, and again, we realized, um, I think we knew this on the outset, that um, everyone has different experiences um, and the impacts in everybody's life is different and not all, not one size was going to fit all in terms of a policy. We try to make our policies overarching so that they can be applied to lots of um, different types of scenarios and situations and made personal to whoever is trying to interpret them. Um, but it is it is still tricky. And we also um, made sure that we used a careful use of language as well, the different types of menopause, whether or not it's early menopause, whether it's being brought on because of a medical condition that somebody needed to, um, to have a hysterectomy for, all those types of things that we we looked at, that it was, it was careful to make sure that um, we were considering all types of menopause and, and all experiences as well. So uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the outcomes then, so we have um, been able to present um, a clear and robust policy for adoption to council. The, the, the policy is um, really cognizant and recognizes that the, the realities of menopause and, and what can um, the impact can be on people's working lives. Um, and also that there was um, a real requirement for staff training as well around the implementation of the policy and what would mean for their service delivery and changes that might have to be made. Um, and again, it's starting and continuing and developing that conversation that it goes from um, 
an awareness to an understanding to you know actual implementation in a in a real and useful way. Um, and it educates all staff, um, including those themselves that are experiencing perimenopause and menopause symptoms. Um, there's there's still lots of uh, information that people going through menopause themselves um, could be doing with having, I think. Um, and that signposting then as well is really useful. And also that the, the policy requires monitoring, as do all of our policies. But it's to ensure that, um, you know, we're getting it right and that if there's any changes to be made. Next slide, please, just before I finish up. So um, I suppose finally, the benefits, it's not a perfect policy. I don't think a perfect policy exists. We've tried our best um, under really good guidance um, from feedback and uh, you know joint delivery on this. But um, from my perspective, inequality, it keeps us compliant. You know, if somebody is classing their disabilities or their, well, their, sorry, their menopause symptoms as a disability, it keeps us compliant in terms of our equality commitments and the legislation. We're responding to the needs of our workforce and hopefully being able to retain um, our workforce uh, as part of that. It complements other um, policies on health and wellbeing initiatives. You know, it's easier to talk about free period products whenever you've already started a conversation about menopause and different health and wellbeing um, programs and initiatives that we have um, of, you know, mental health first aiders and signposting to all of those types of things It you know, you, you can see it um, as a as a suite um, of support for staff. It's also a tool for addressing absences. You know, in the past, it's been maybe thought to people not want to say that menopause is causing their um, their absence and maybe misunderstanding of the conditions that um, have have um, come as a result of their menopause symptoms. Um, so, you know, it's, it's using a positive tool there um, and it provides the opportunity for signposting as well for people to get support. And again, it just finally makes staff aware internally and externally that there is help and support available. You're not alone. I think whenever staff are able to see that there is a specific policy um, in council regarding menopause, that wouldn't be there if they were the only person that was going to be availing of it. So it's not, you're not alone. And it's not, it's not the employee's job to try to fix it. There is a policy in place there to try to make sure that we've covered all the bases. And I suppose... Just to say that, just before I finish off, um, one of the union reps who was a really keen advocate for this um, kinds of policy being implemented, Eileen Ford, I, I approached her just to say, look, I'm trying to get some feedback on this policy. And I know you yourself uh, were so keen for it to be implemented. You know, what's your feedback on the difference that the policy has made, if it's made any um, positive uh, changes and she she came back to me I'll just read you what she said she said this policy has quite literally prevented a number of our female members of staff from handing in their notice because of the menopause symptoms that they were experiencing and this would have been a huge loss to these women and their families not only financially but in terms of those women's confidence the council would have also suffered a massive loss of experiences on those particular skill sets and this policy should never become a tick box exercise, but it should remain active and a change in policy that brings positivity to both women and their employers. So I think that that says it all. Um, it's not perfect and there will be improvements to be made over the next number of years when it's reviewed. But I think we've made a good start. Um, so I'll finish um, there just with the final slide, um, just with my email address, if anybody needs to follow up with me. And there are some um, organizations and websites that we would have used in terms of additional research with so NHS, Menopause Matters. And as I've mentioned, the Equality Commission have a publication there on menopause in the workplace. So thank you for your time and your patience. Thank you for listening. And thank you so much indeed. And that's wonderful to get that feedback um, and to have the umbrella organisation as well that you can support the, the businesses as well. We have had uh, a few Q&A questions put in. I am conscious that we're overrunning due to my um, cock up, I think is the way to put it at the very start. Uh, first of all, quick question to Tara. Uh, do we women that suffer from hormone imbalances suffer more during menopause, especially those with PCOS? Uh, Tara, could you pick up on that one if you're still with us? I'm still here, Pamela. Um, okay. Thank you so much for the question. Um, so first of all, um, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, already in itself is a hormone dysregulation or what we call a, 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 a deranged metabolism. There's very few clients that I work with that you can actually say on an evidence-based standpoint that have a deranged or a faulty metabolism. but polycystic ovarian clients or clients with that con clinical condition do have a faulty metabolism. So your basal metabolic rate is less than a normal healthy female. So that in itself 
before you hit menopause and you're decreasing estrogen, progesterone and testosterone already has massive impacts for your body composition. It has massive impacts for your about your body's ability to for insulin sensitivity, um, PCOS um, conditions. Also, you burn through proteins at a much higher rate, especially when you sleep. Um, your body's ability to maintain muscle mass is much more greatly impaired as well. So if you go back to what I was saying earlier in my presentation, for you more so than anything, because when I work with clients who have polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome, especially clients who are in the menopause with PCOS, probably 95% of them really, really struggle to manage their weight because they go on diets that aren't supporting their condition. So their nutritional support is inadequate. So for you as a PCOS client who's already now decreased in hormone or estrogen, progesterone and um, testosterone, there is a cascade here of, of hormonal changes. Now, I don't know if you're in HRT, that, well, obviously uh, that's a conversation you probably would need to have with your own GP or your own pharmacist. But from my experience in dealing with clinical conditions, PCOS and women in menopause, increase the protein in your diet. Um, yes, your hormones are most certainly imbalanced. A lot of women, but again, I don't know if you're on medication, are you in metformin, which tends to be the most com common form of medication that women who have PCOS are on. Um, you're at higher risk of other auto as an autoimmune condition. Um, so the greatest risk to most clients who've got PCOS is, is their, their obesity or being overweight. That's the greatest risk to your health. So as a diet coach and a fitness coach and somebody who, like I'm, I have a clinical qualification in dealing with PCOS, it's weight management. It's reducing your weight, which tends to help PCOS conditions as well. So there are many factors at play here. I don't know all the details, so I can't give a, give a definitive answer. But in relation to your hormones, that's definitely a conversation to have with your, your pharmacist or your GP. In relation to your diet and your lifestyle, those are standard. Get plenty of protein into your diet. Definitely supplement. Look at your vitamin D levels. Get them tested and look at your vitamin D3. Maybe you might need to supplement with vitamin D3, your essential fatty acids. So find the fats, good fats in your diet, increase those. If you don't like oily fish, then look at supplementing with what's called an EPA and a DHA in the good dosages and optimal dosages. You can contact me afterwards if you want and I'll give you all the details. Um, and also get moving, get moving every single day. Your body's ability to regulate your your blood sugar levels is impaired. The more you move, the more you're shuttling out those sugars out of your muscle cells. That's really, really important. So that, in short, is an answer. I could talk to you all day about it. Contact <laughs> me privately and I'll give you more details. Thank you so much indeed, Tara. Uh, this is one that has come in, and I think, Anne, you touched on this uh, very briefly. Is menopause classed as a disability? Does it have to be classed and noted as if this, as if it is? Well, I suppose the first thing to say would be the only person that can um, diagnose a disability would be a medical professional, usually your GP. Um, again, how uh, disabilities are usually uh, diagnosed is if they have that long term, whether it's a year or more, um, whether or not it's mental or physical and whether or not it's impacting on your daily life um, and the tasks that you complete, whether that's attending your employment, looking after your kids, whatever it is. But I suppose um, it depends. Again, as we've said, not one size fits all. So not everybody with um, menopause symptoms will have severe symptoms. Not everybody will be impacted um, in, a, in a really negative way for that long of a period of time and impact on their on their mental health and lifestyle that a GP may, dis may decide that it wouldn't be classed as a disability. So it would be up to the personal circumstances and um, whatever the assessment would be by their healthcare provider. But in terms of employability and those sorts of things, it definitely has the potential to be classed um, and considered by an employer in those ways, if that's how it's framed by a medical um, professional's feedback. I hope that Thank answers the question. Thank, thanks, Anne. Uh, there's um, a, sort of on that basis, um, I'm going to put this one to Jen from an HR point of view, if I could. Can or should employers request a doctor's certificate to confirm menopause where an employee is requesting adjustments or has a uh, per attendance record due to the symptoms? As a responsible employer, I think you should be putting in measures to as best accommodate people that are dealing with symptoms without having to create a barrier for them to go back to a GP and, and get a, a formal diagnosis. 
if you're looking after your employees through a, a comprehensive health and well-being program, um, you, you should be putting in place changes to keep them within the workplace anyway um, as part of your retention policy. Lovely. So it's it's if if you can avoid having to ask for the, the yeah. certificate, then then do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. And uh, can employers employees make use of the condition management program for support and to help manage uh, symptoms? Yes, absolutely. I suppose for anybody who's not um, familiar with the condition management program, um, it's free for anybody who's struggling to stay in employment in the workforce. Um, it has input from professionals such as OTs and physiotherapists, and you know it covers a range of um, conditions, including anxiety, um, just building confidence, and creating a healthier lifestyle. And yes, it's open to everybody to avail of who needs it. Lovely, thank you. And this is one that I think both you and uh, Jen could answer. Uh, it says, I work in an oil, all male small business. Any advice on how I can approach this subject in a way that will cause least embarrassment? And I would say that will cause least embarrassment all around to employer and the employee as well. We'll throw it to Jen first. <laughs> um, being in a predominantly male environment, um, <laughs> I would be just off the mindset, grab a little bit of horns and just address, address the elephant in the room. <laughs> um, and I just say it um, and, and identify that that support needs to be there. To be quite honest, a, a lot of our male uh, colleagues would identify that they instantly can relate to it because uh, they have members of their family, be it their sister, their partner, their wife, or whatever, and they're more empathetic uh, re regarding it than you might imagine, and and have a better understanding and dealing with it in their own lives probably uh, as well. Yep, I think that that's good advice. Um, we're also very good at um disarming people with humor and I mean I remember my mum um, I mean it's never talked about but I remember her sitting um in the evening with a cardigan half on half off because it was just easier just to keep going like that and put it on and off and uh, bless her so I, I obviously have taken after mother with the uh, with the symptoms as well and would you recommend that because it is it's wonderful having these um policies in place but it is another to to sort of go up and say look this this is what's happening to me but as women I think we are getting much better at talking amongst ourselves and then that leads to giving somebody the courage to perhaps go forward and talk to somebody in management about the the symptoms that they're having. Yeah I suppose to be honest um in the public sector taking the bull by the horns wouldn't really be what we're known <laughs> for um so we were probably Break out of the box <laughs> we would probably take more of a softly softly approach to be honest um we would put things like in our staff newsletter it's usually a good way to start a conversation just you know posters around things we would deliver training as well i deliver some training myself it's you know starting the conversation more gradually and i suppose taking um cognizance of what our own staff are comfortable with talking about as well um and then and then eventually just just get to the stage of getting on with it and this is what's happening this is what's needed so this is what we're doing um and throwing that equity um, statement around sometimes is you know we need to put in place what people require that's just the way it is but we would maybe start off a wee bit um, more softly softly to be honest well listen ladies thank you so much indeed uh, Tara Anne and Jen uh, if, uh, there's a couple more questions coming in but we are um, um, have, have overrun already so any other questions that come in will be answered by email and those questions and answers will be forwarded on to all the uh, participants today. Thank you. And again, on behalf of the Mid Ulster MP, I'd like to thank you for coming today. Big thank you to each of our speakers. Um, even if this starts a conversation in a few businesses or gives a little more clarity, then our work here is done today. So thank you very much indeed. As a follow up, you will be receiving an evaluation request after today's webinar. We would ask you that you complete these as it allows the LMP to continue to provide training and support on topics that are of benefit to you all. And this is really important and we would really appreciate as many of you as possible to fill it out. It's very short tick box exercise. 
unlike this, which is not a tick box exercise, they, the webinar is, but this is going to lead to more discussions and uh, in businesses. And we hope the businesses don't follow the tick box exercise, but it's just two questions at the end on what else you would be interested in hearing about. Um, I think it'd be wonderful to see more councils and other businesses taking such a proactive approach and initiative as well. Now, if you'd leave, like to rewatch any of this at any time, the webinar will be available on Mid Ulster Council's YouTube channel over the next few days. Just go to playlists, choose Mid Ulster LMP. The link will be shared via the social media channels as well. And other webinars are up there too. So feel free to watch them as well. With that, we'll bring today's session to a close. Thank you so much indeed for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure being part of this webinar. Thanks very much indeed. Bye now.